Thank you. And uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, talk today. And um, let me just make sure I can there. Uh, I, I'm, my talk is going to wander around a little bit more than I think some other talks I've given. I uh, am going to um, talk a little bit about my experience uh, in computing as from a from a student to now, and then I'm going to talk about well, well, uh, let me. Here's my outline. So I'm going to briefly discuss uh, the the computing industry. And don't worry, I'm not going to um, go into excruciating detail. It's mainly I feel it's on the cusp. It it, it is evol It is it is in a new state that I think often we don't pay attention to as people who are interested in the climate problem. Computing is more like a service, uh, but I think it's there's plenty of opportunity for mathematics here that we aren't paying as close attention to. So I'm trying to give some context for, for those people who might be able to work closer to the interface. So then I'm gonna talk about the physical problem of climate and weather in the time and frequency domain. And then I'm gonna give a brief introduction to time parallelism, which has been one of the ways of um, getting by some of the challenges that I've been interested in, but I think there are others. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about fast singular limits and how this works with low frequencies. And if I have time, I'm gonna give a sketch of how some of these time parallel methods uh, work for oscillatory PDEs like we have in weather and climate. And then I'm gonna uh, discuss new work and um, I hope give some uh, ideas, just some, uh, just a few ideas, kind of crazy ideas, but sort of to kick off a discussion of could there be further things we could do with mathematics than we have so far. All right, so um, this there there was this uh, Moore's law which was a rule of thumb that the number of transistors on a computer chip doubles every two, every two years or so. And this was my experience from the time I was an undergraduate learning how to, how to do computing on cards. It's like every year there was like a new computer and it, you, you plug it into the wall and it doesn't really cost much more power. You know, so when I'm, when I'm getting my master's degree, I can do a 32 cubed simulation. And then a few years later, 64, blah, 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 up till, it was about when we started being able to do 512 cubed without batting an eyelash. You know, here's your new service. I'm like, yay, 512 cubed. <laughs> well, that, so that was in this, during this time, where this Moore's law or Denard scaling was uh, was in operation, where it was working. So now though, not now, I think this was starting sometime in the 1990s, um, this Moore's law came to an end. Uh, this quote unquote free lunch is over, was over. So it's a long time ago now since the free lunch was over. And it, it's really due to the physical limitations of chip of the silicon. So this is different than before. You know, there would be there would be um, discussions about what what is the best type of computer service for science, and what do those look like? What does the memory look like? But this is different because we've actually reached a physical limitation of the material. Um, so this first came to my attention in, um, 2008 or nine. This is, this is a picture of <clears throat> the Roadrunner computer that came to us at Los Alamos. 
and it cost a lot of money. I don't remember how much, but uh, the computer scientists were thrilled with this, but the, all the scientists were really put off. People were yelling at each other in the hallways. It was very, it was difficult to program because it was, it used these FPGA type of chips and it meant that actual scientists who were more interested in the scientific outcome of the code were forced to like do bit swapping and stuff in their code and nobody wanted to do this. Uh, but I was like, why did they buy this computer? And I started finding out things about Moore's law and the how silicon had run out of run out of run out of gas or petrol or something for us. So so that's a long time ago now, 2008 or nine. And there have been many now article industry, computing industry articles, <clears throat> articles from the climate and weather community. Um, I also then, uh, before before I go down this path, I will tell you, I had this interesting experience at Los Alamos where they were training us to code on GPUs. Um, and we were learning how to do asynchro asynchronous computing. Um, and uh, we so it was an entire week of matrix vector multiply, which is a, was slightly dry even for me. But it was it was uh, the last day the asynchronous computing came and the I was in a classroom with image processing experts. There were a few of us who did time evolution problems. Uh, but when it came time to do asynchronous matrix vector multiply, all of the people who did time evolution problems could not figure out how to do it. And all the people who did image processing could, could do it just fine. And this sort of alerted me to the fact that we have some way of viewing our problem not as like a four dimensional image, but as uh, we're, we're really glued to our the notion of our time step. That it evolves one, the, the climate simulations evolve one time step at a time. And it, this is true even when we're doing data integration, you know, we're integrating forward and backward in time and uh, things like that. So so here's a, here's a quote from a paper I've, uh, on, called Science and Research Policy at the End of Moore's Law in Nature Electronics. And here's, so this is, this paper is the computing industry in the United States giving evidence that it is time for the government to invest in research in computer architectures. Previously, the computing industry had done its own research. So they had managed to make tons of money and in infuse the economy with new things, all with like a 10% research budget. <laughs> but the, but and so in this paper, they also give a graph of how research into computer architectures is costing more and more. So they're arguing the gov government should, should pony up for some really blue skies research for computing. But one of the things they say in there here is that, uh, the, the performance wall for microprocessors was not widely anticipated by us, the science scientists. And as a result, we've been unable to take advantage of this, of the, the ways in which the computing industry has have given us these, these uh, many core uh, computers. We haven't really been able to take advantage of it. Around the same time, uh, we find papers like Crossing the Chasm. So this is two, 2017, where in this paper, and this is uh, probably some people who are on this call and have given talks at the seminar series, um, some of the most important model developers in Europe and are basically saying we could be entering the era where the time it takes for, from the time we find out about a machine to the time when they shut off the machine, we can't port our code on it. And finally, um, our science ambitions cannot be achieved with the computer. 
So this is this is this is wondering what to do about it, proposing things. Probably many people have heard about separation of concerns, trying to separate scientific things and algorithmic things about the climate model from what it looks like on an architecture. But this problem is still going on. And now uh, in, in more recent papers, this, this argument is still going on about this digital revolution of earth system science. And one of the alternatives to Moore's law is something called more than more, which means focusing on an application and developing computers that way. So I don't, I don't have sort of an answer to um, what the right thing to do is, except I've been trying to, um, you know, contribute myself with many of my collaborators. So. Uh, the codes themselves are extremely complex. So there's entire international communities just for one part of the model, developing uh, models. Now with the introduction of machine learning and AI, they're becoming even more complex. Uh, so I'm not gonna talk about any of those <laughs> other complex issues. I'm just gonna talk about the issue of the time step and the perception of, of we uh, we we are many of us perceive the climate problem as you know there's an image there's a three dimensional image of space time and it or of, of space and it evolves one time step at a time mm -hmm. so the problem uh, that time parallelism try try to address is that the optimization of parallelization in space you know uh, has already we're almost there and what we can do with a certain time step. Um, but if you if you then use more grid points, what happens is uh, the time step has to go down from mathematics. So you can use time steppers that take a larger time step like uh, implicit methods, but then you're paying an accuracy cost. So this this balance between how we how we refine in time and space, um, is is an interesting issue. So this brings me to the ocean model, and I worked on an ocean model while I was at Los Alamos. And I have here uh, pictures of, it's, an, it's a model problem for a standalone ocean. The ocean model itself used to be used in the community climate model that was centered at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in uh, Boulder, Colorado. But this was doing standalone tests of the model itself. And so you see on one side of the screen, the kind of resolution you need for climate simulations. And this is a snapshot of potential temperature. It's just a channel that goes around. It's like the Antarctic circumpolar current in the ocean, but it's periodic on two sides. And the difference between the two is the grid resolution. And you can see that for the uh, tenth of a degree simulations, you get more structure. But um, it's more important than that. The problem is more important than that. Uh, if we look here at this next set of slides, underneath those snapshots, what I have is a vertical slice of the potential temperature in the ocean. So when you have plenty of resolution, you get a different thermal structure than when you don't. And this this is, I, I'm gonna call it, it's an order one physical process that happens in the ocean when the potential temperature from the Earth's sun shining at the Equator the pole to temp the pole to equator temperature gradient gets converted into kinetic energy and without enough resolution this doesn't happen. So it was it one of the most important uh, things that happened in ocean modeling was not numerical work not higher resolution it was uh, finding a model that sort of it it made the potential temperature correct but it didn't really give you any more kinetic energy. This is, this is the Genton-McWilliams ocean parameterization. 
as far as I know, this is still run in most climate simulations. So this is this is one of the key physical processes that even today with computers we have, we can't resolve. So that the this it's not even the fine grid, it's not even like the fine structures of you know the surface layer. Um, it's it's what we can't simulate with what we have even today. Okay, so I was interested in seeing if we could run higher resolution simulations by using some time parallelism. And I'm just gonna really briefly discuss that. Um, it's a very old idea. Um, and there's many different kinds. Um, so I'm gonna touch on this first kind, this revisionist integral deferred correction, because I feel like it helps to introduce what time parallelism is. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about um, parareal methods. But I can point you to, there's a nice article from 2015 now, so you know, almost 10 years old, 50 years of time parallel integration by Martin Gander. But he has a new book too, I think um, I, I looked on his webpage and I don't see it, but I have heard rumors of it. So I think I think it's there. And he he will have integrated, you know, the last decade of time parallel mathematics. So that would be the a good place to find out what's going on if you get interested. I also wanted to show there's a there's an organization called parallelintime.org. And they, this is the number of publications over time. You can see that the interest in it has really grown. It hasn't diminished, it's, it's grown. So interesting things are being discovered and they also run a, a workshop. I think it's every two years. Um, and there's a lot of information on their website, parallelthetime.org. So I'm gonna just, uh, briefly discuss how one type of time parallel algorithm works. So you can see, I'm hoping to convince you that it's really not much different than, uh, this is not really much different than um, the difference between third order Adams bash fourth and fourth order Runga Kutta. There are different errors. There are different ways you assemble the problem. And, but they each give different errors and they converge differently as you refine the time step. Um, so I'm giving an example here of fourth order Runga Kutta, which is a pretty standard method. And this first time step, delta T1, is broken into four stages. And the way Runga Kutta this works is you do stage one and you use those results in stage two, you finish that one, you use those results in stage three until you get to the end of your first time step, and then you do it again. So this top line is the time to solution for doing five time steps of uh, fourth order Runga Kutta in its usual uh, standard serial time stepping way. So there's this method, this revisionist deferred correction method where in fact, what happens is you can see the wall clock time, the time to solution is the black line, is made shorter because what happens is instead of waiting to complete the first time step before starting the second one, you start the second one after the first stage of the first one and, uh, and vice versa. So they, in this method, you can use deferred correction to help make the um, time stepping more accurate, but you pay a price for it in like stability domain and what size of the time step you can take. So um, this is this is quite a bit like this, even though it's time parallel and it's getting you a faster wall clock time or alternative, alternatively, you can look at it as a way to, um, in the same wall clock time, do a higher, a, a higher, accurate, more higher accuracy model. Um, it, it's just a rearrangement of the steps. So it isn't some mysterious thing that is uh, sort of getting around the arrow of time. So my question, right. 
Yeah. One question here, but you, you need communication between the pros, each of those processes, right? With the others. Yes. Yes. And do you need that at every of those small steps for overall processes or just the newly starting one? So I don't know the answer to that. Gemma might. Thank you, do. But I've only ever coded it in serial. So yes, uh, me too. Right. I'll get back to you in a few months because yeah. there's plans. <laughs> <laughs> but, but people are starting to study that, and it, and it's definitely not. Um, it's definitely not uh, the case that everything is known about even these simple models. How they work, okay. like even with the larger, you know, how do you do this with uh, with an atmosphere and ocean coupled? I don't know, right? So that's that's an even tougher problem. So um, the the second type of method I'm going to introduce to you is this parareal method. This was very this was introduced in 1964. In fact, it's this multiple shooting method, and then there was this important paper in 2001 by Leon Mede and Turanici, and in the figure. I'm not going to discuss the algorithm too much because I really want to give listeners of this talk an intuition for what's going on. And then you can look at slides or papers that I've cited later if you want details. But the in this method, you take a very large, in this case, um, pink uh, time step. I can't I can't actually see my own slide here so let me right uh oh I just lost my oh there it is <laughs> uh you take a large where one where these large circles are you take a large time step and you sweep out some lar large number of time steps and you're using a really cheap course propagator, course propagator to do this. And then the where you get time parallelism is in between all the large time steps. You take tiny time steps all at the same time though. So large time step between one and two and two and three and so on are doing their fine time steps all at the same time. And then you update this at the large time step points. Um, and when I first saw this, I thought this was um, crazy. And I, I actually was first introduced to this by Jean Cote at the AMM program at the Newton Institute. And you can still see, it's a little bit hard to hear, but you can see he's doing some of the first experiments. So Jean Cote was, or is a model developer for the Canadian uh, weather model. And, um, he found what people keep discovering all the time about tar time parallelism is it works great for the heat equation, but not for um, really hyperbolic or parabolic sorts of problems. Um, and, and I also put down here my favorite paper on uh, this particular method, which is nonlinear convergence analysis of the parareal method, Gander and Her Herrer here, they actually do the case for like the Lorenz attractor. So you can see what does this look like for a chaotic system. Um, so here is here is a movie that Adam Petal made for the heat equation, which, which did not go because uh, there, it's sweeping out large time steps and now it's doing fine time steps all at the same time in between. It's going to hit its next large time step. It's going to correct and do its next sweep. Okay. So uh, parareal, and I'm not trying to convince anyone to do parareal. I just, I, I'm curious about it myself. And so have many other people been, and it has been applied to like MHD turbulence. Um, here, I just give an example of something uh, of a paper based on this event 
based parareal. And uh, you can see that the parareal method is getting uh, computing gains. Um, there's a lot of questions still about it uh, and a lot of work going on. For example, people are starting to study how they work with chaotic systems. So those are new results just in the last couple of years. Can okay, I ask so a question about this talk. Um, yep. So you said for the fusion, uh, you, you, I mean, you mentioned Lorenz. Um, so do you need some kind of contraction? Do you need some kind of hyperbolicity in the system, or like would, would it wouldn't work for um, for Hamiltonian systems, or would it so work? So in this case, I would say it does. It's not whether it works or not. It's how you set up the problem. So the the if you just if you were just to do a straight, let's say, linear advection. The parareal does not work very well. But if you if you reformulate the system, and this is what I just what I'm about to talk about with fast singular limits, if you reformulate the system, uh, you can get really good speed ups with parareal. But you it, it's you it's almost like the parareal method is a method that is really good at driving amplitudes to uh, their correct solution, but it's not so good at the phase. Okay. So if you, if you, if you, uh, in fact, I think, I don't think it's true to say it doesn't see the phase, but it, it's almost blind to the phase as far as my experience of it goes. Mm -hmm. So um, I have been interested, as Gemma said, a long time in how oscillations work in fluids and I am very interested in fast singular limits. And you know, you might say, you, you right, rightly say, what does this have to do with time parallelism? So I'd like to show you the frequency spectrum of the ocean as measured, you know, from the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, these the, the, these are three. So there's just an instrument there measuring. The frequency, and then they take the Fourier transform of it, and this is a you know one is close to the surface, one is in the middle, and one is closer to the topography. But the key is you can see in here uh, inertia waves. You can see the tides in these peak frequencies. Um, but then this interesting thing happens. There's this there's a strong low frequency signal here. Uh, and in the in the this is called the geostrophic eddy range, and this is a topic of interest to I would call them geophysical fluid dynamicists who are trying to understand theories for why do you get this. So it's high power. The the thing to notice is it's high power and low frequency. There are higher frequency than say the tides or the rotation frequency. So something interesting is happening at higher frequencies too, but the main power is in the low frequencies. So um, it's no, been known for a long time now in ODEs and um, in ODEs, for example, uh, Sanders Verhulst uh, book on av averaging methods and um, fast singular limits, which you know, were, were being heavily studied in the late 1980s and 1990s when you have a problem like the one I've written down here. So if U is a vector of unknown, so it's not a scalar, it's a vector, it could have U, V, W, buoyancy, you know, scalar transport. Um, and then you have a linear term. The linear term here is completely oscillatory. So there are problems that don't have completely oscillatory terms and I'm are linear operators, and I'm not going to talk about those, but those are addressed in other types of work. And then I've I have a nonlinear term here, and there's two arguments to it that will indicate that this is a quadratic nonlinearity, but cubic ones are also interesting. Um, and then there's another linear operator D here uh, on the end, which that is going to have a only purely decay. So it's more of an amplitude, decaying amplitude operator. So this, this one over epsilon 
results in time oscillations on the scale of epsilon. And standard numerical methods have to take time steps of order epsilon to get an accurate result. Again, many ways to take a larger time step than epsilon, but the balance between error and um, and getting getting to the end faster is is a problem. And these are the types of equations that give rise to low frequencies created from tri triadic, uh, in the case of quadratic nonlinearity, uh, linear wave resonances. And I'm going to talk about mo more about this in just a minute. But I have to go back to, since I've been showing pictures of computers, here's a picture of the ENIAC. Um, uh, this, this is from Wikipedia. And it has uh, Glenn Beck in the background and Betty Snyder in the in the foreground, and they're programming this. This was this was one of the computers, or one like it, where when um, at the end of World War II, everybody was tired of doing uh, ballistic missile calculations, and people wanted to do client or weather predictions. And this the the this computer being used for weather was very exciting to some people, but they knew about this epsilon problem, <laughs> although they might not have called it that. Um, so uh, these, these people of the day um, got together to say, how could they overcome these mathematical challenges to use this computer? And um, it was Jewel Charney, uh, who who really had the mathematical insight. And one of his first papers, you know, he's looking at weather maps and computing um, critical balances, trying to figure out what what's happening. I actually have a copy of a letter that he wrote to von Neumann, which we're hoping to put in, um, in a SIAM review article on this topic, um, where he where he is outlined some of these ideas. Um, and then I have to say, so because I really think this is funny, Peter Lynch made a made a weather model based on their original one for the phone called the Phoniac. <laughs> but the, the key thing about this is what used to be the world's biggest supercomputer it was is now on a phone. That's how far we've come. That's how far we've come. Um, and what what happened after that was people are like people were discovering in the mathematics the fact that there was a I I don't think they would call it a low frequency structure, but that but this is what they were discussing. So they were looking for a quote unquote slow manifold. It's my opinion that it isn't a slow, it's a fast manifold. <laughs> um, and then they had these papers, which I love to read out loud, um, and I've done it in many talks. Uh, and I have to give my credit to my thesis advisor, John Boyd, who first did this, and I thought it was so funny and telling that I stole it from him. So here's here's the order of the papers. Um, Oh, we'll start with this on the existence of the slow manifold, 1986, and then later 1987 on the non-existence of the slow manifold. And then by the time we get to 1991, we have the slow manifold. What is it? So it, I really feel like this is people discussing the low frequency content of the PDEs and its relationship to the actual atmosphere. So this is a long time ago, and I don't think we're finished with this either. Um, so here's an example of the Buzanesk equations. And here I have two skew Hermitian linear operators, and I'm going to have to go quickly through this. Uh, but they're both oscillatory, but they're oscillating at different frequencies, or they could do. Um, this is still a quadratic nonlinear operator. and you can see, um, so U is this vector, three components of velocity and a buoyancy term. And for those who study geophysical fluid dynamics, 
this this linear operator it talks about geostrophic balance and this one which is the fruit number in it is associated with hydrostatic balance and the smaller those numbers are um the higher the oscillations are due to these balances um so you can find the wave solutions of the of the linear operators and i want to stress that there's no assumption that the nonlinearity is weak here it's not it that when you have a one over epsilon in front of an operator that is purely oscillatory, its eigenvalues are purely oscillatory and don't contribute at least directly to the to the amplitude, which is what what you're talking about when you talk about weak nonlinearity. You're talking about the amplitude. So uh, it it if you if you had a linear operator that had real parts, you would you would start talking about something like that. So this, this system has these zero modes for all wave numbers, and it has fast waves. And these zero modes are associated with this low frequency. Um, and let's see, I'm going to skip that one. I'm going to talk about this uh, swinging spring, uh, which, is a, which is a good model, I feel, for what happens in the atmosphere and ocean. So there's a spring and it has, um, and you pull the spring down and it has freedom to move and it's springing and nonlinearity then cause it, causes it to do swinging. And then it oscillates back and forth between springing and swinging. And this is also called the elastic pendulum. Um, but when you give it, uh, allow it to have fully three-dimensional movement, not only is there swinging and springing, but there's a very slow procession. So the, the procession, it swings and springs, and then it goes chink, chink. And so the slowest, the lowest frequency is not the swinging or the springing. It is this procession. And in fact, there was a recent paper, I meant to put it on here and didn't, uh, where um, some people have computed the, uh, that there is a procession for the barotropic vorticity equation on the sphere, and they've computed what actually those frequencies are. Um, maybe I'll put it on it later, on my slide later. Okay, um, I'm going to have to skip through a lot of this math. Uh, um, uh, I'll just briefly talk about this slide. So there's no way anyone can read this slide in detail. This is if you want to look at it later. But essentially, if you Fourier transform this oscillatory PDE that I just showed you with quadratic nonlinearity, you'll get a term like the one I've circled here, which has these little omegas are called triadic frequencies. And those are the linear waves. Each one of these is like the dispersion relation for a linear wave. And um, you could see that there could be cases where these linear waves add up to something small, but they're not zero. And these are, these are called near resonances. And these are what I've been very interested in in terms of the PDEs because our classic averaging techniques don't really work there and you have to do something special. So uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do, I'll also, I'll do this slide. So what you have, what I do, what I'm interested in, not just me, this is the classic method of averaging. You take all of your unknowns and you map them using an exponential operator into a new space V. This V we call the modulation variable. And you get a new PDE instead of one for you, an evolutionary PDE for you, where you have a one over epsilon L, you get a new PDE where there is no one over epsilon L. And you get a term that looks like this. And this in the Fourier space is the one I just showed you where you can see how the linear waves combine and they could make a small frequency that way. 
but you don't have a linear one over epsilon. So the asymptotic, this is the asymptotic solution. You use a mapping, just like you could do a coordinate transformation, only you take the limit. And when you take the limit here, so this is a limit and averaging over S, and you can see that the U bar here is over T. So the only things that get averaged are this over, over this S. Um, you get you get a you get a new PDE just for the zero frequencies, and this is what they were looking at in the 1980s and 1990s in the subject of fast singular limits. So I, I'm going to skip the algorithmic details. I'm going to I'm going to skip a lot of this because we're running out of time. But I'll show you uh, just a few things like um, this. This is one of Adam Petal's pictures uh, from his thesis. And the bottom graph is a one-dimensional shallow water equation, which has this type of nonlinearity and oscillatory linear operator. And it's got time along the bottom axis. And this is just a standard RK4 method. So it has, it's got, starts off with a hill. It's a relaxation problem in the height and it goes out and comes back and it goes out and comes back, but it's a fully nonlinear problem. But the two, the two figures on the top, the top one is you do the mapping and you do this averaging. And what you see is this. So in this domain, we can take a time step of 50 times greater than we can in this domain. And then the middle picture is just this, is just the top one rotated back rotated, when I say rotated, mapped back using the exponential operator. So that the, when you're looking in the modulation domain, it's a different problem than when you're, it's a different math problem than when you're, when you've got all of, all of your terms there. So I'm going to, I'm going to skip all of this because uh, I'm going on too long, but there's a, there's a papers that we've written. So, uh, Parareal convergence for oscillatory PDEs with finite time sta scale separations. That was Adam Petal's thesis. That's from 2019, and it isn't a it isn't a paper that advances parareal. It is a paper that advances the time stepping estimate for oscillatory PDEs, like we like to solve in the climate problem. And then we use those results to say something about the way parareal works. But we're, we're starting to use this now for by itself without time parallel methods, just to see what's going on with the accuracy. I'm gonna skip all this. So there's a new paper with uh, Juliana Rosemeyer, which um, talks about a similar type of parareal method, but for multi-level. Uh, multi-level, so in, in the regular parareal method, there's just lot, two steps fine time steps and large time steps, but you can do it for multi-levels and you have to change like your averaging window. So uh, I'm gonna skip some of this. Uh, this is work on um, a, a phase average method, which is like what I was just talking to you about uh, by uh, Hiroa Yamazaki and Colin Cotter at Imperial. They have a new paper about this. They're not using parareal. They're time stepping using phase averaging. Um, um, and now I just want to say there, the other thing, I'm sort of on the new work here. Um, there are even more interesting things to be done with the mapping and averaging. So, um, Tim Andrews, who's just uh, finished his PhD, he studied, so here, here is a transform. This is the standard mapping is on the left of the screen that I've been showing you, um, but you can alter it to include another term that is L inverse C. Now this C, is like one, so the nonlinear term, not only does it 
create turbulence and things like that. It also creates constants or constants over time. And this is, this is what these fast singular limits are. So you can actually add that into the, <clears throat> the mapping and get another type of domain with another type of another type of uh, modulation. It's another type of modulation variable. Um, and I'm going to skip that, that all of these, all of these are just for toy problems right now too. So there's no, none of this to the best of my knowledge, none of this will be tried and I wouldn't advise it <laughs> in a, in a, in a real model. So we're quite far away from that anyway. So I'm just going to summarize real quick. Um, what I did was I introduced, what I've done in this talk is I've introduced this notion that uh, the computing industry itself is going through a large transformation. And the, the time when, you know, in the very beginning, it didn't used to be or it didn't feel like a service to me. I mean, I remember when the first Cray engineers came and taught us how to debug our codes in hex, right? And it, it was more like we were working with them than somebody builds a big computer and they better make it the way we want it, right? So uh, we're entering an era where even some of the world's best climate model de developers are writing papers that maybe the computing technologies can't keep up with our scientific aspirations. So this seems to me important to talk about as a potential powerful thing for mathematics to get involved with, just like Charney and von Neumann doing something new so they could use the computer to do weather and climate. So I also, I also introduced time parallel methods but I really think of them as also studying the freak, this frequency domain, like uh, I have with my collaborators. And Colin Cotter and Werner Bauer do another very interesting type of phase averaging in this in mapped domains. So uh, still a work in progress, but um, hopefully contributing to sort of shaking up our view of how we do these computations. And then I revisited the importance of low frequencies. Um, and I and I want to sort of issue a challenge for the listeners or the attendees of this workshop to start thinking outside the box. And you know, what if we could use, I, I'm going to put two wild ideas up here. I don't I don't know if these are good ideas, but I just think they're examples of how we could think of the problem. Uh, could we use machine learning techniques to find mappings to the low frequencies of the climate models and build our numerics around that? Can we use this machine learning or any other tricks we have up our algorithmic sleeves to think of how we could think of the problems in frequency domain or optimizations of frequency domains? something like that. Could we consider climate problems as images uh, where we kind of free ourselves from, uh, I don't I don't mean we can't pay, we have to pay attention to the time set. We have to pay attention to turbulence and potential chaos and all that. But um, really people who do image processing in movies and in, and, 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 uh, you know, even in the 2D plane, seems to me to be less constrained than me, who I'm sort of wedded to this notion. Every single simulation starts out with an initial condition and it creeps forward. So maybe it's an image that morphs. Maybe it's a four-dimensional, and maybe we could use some machine learning to understand how that works with different parameter spaces. So I'm hoping uh, there are listeners today who have better ideas than this, but are, are going forward knowing that this, the nature of computers is, um, well, it's, it's, they're, they're at a cusp of technology too, and maybe 
we need some fraction of the mathematics community to stop thinking of the computing as a service and thinking of it more as uh, could we work together to do something to do something else. And so, so with that, I'll stop. Thank you, Beth. Do we have any questions? <laughs>